praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet tonight and let's praise the Lord. Well, I feel like praising, praising Him. Oh, I feel like praising, praising Him. I'm gonna praise Him in the morning. Sun goes down. 
my field I would wield sickles brave and true in the fight for the right I would dare and do spend my days in thy praise all the journey through let me live close to thee each day let me live close to thee take my hand dear Lord and guide me on
be calling There'll be no time to mend With joy I'll go up singing I've held out to the end I am determined to hold out to the end Jesus is with me On Him I can depend And I know I have salvation For feeling in my soul upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. When we wait upon him, he's going to bring a restoration to our soul. You see, he gave it all for you and for me when he died on the cross of Calvary. He shed a sinless, spotless blood. The Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. There is still power in the blood of the Lamb. Blah.
you gave the ultimate sacrifice. And Lord, we thank you for that blood. And we bless your name for it. If you have your Bible, turn with me this evening to the book of Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. For some time now, we have uh, been looking at the writings of, of Luke, and he has written the Gospel of Luke as well as the book of Acts, and he talks about the ministry of Jesus, and for a few moments tonight, before we get into uh, Acts chapter 4, I want to bring you up to date of where we left off last Wednesday night. We all know that Jesus was sent by God himself to, uh, to minister upon this earth, and for three years, Jesus ministered to the people. He opened the blinded eyes. He calmed the storms. He opened the deaf ears so they could hear. The lame could now walk. Jesus raised the dead. He fed uh, 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. And there were many other miracles that took place during his ministry. But all of this was coming uh, into a, a change. There was a transition in the way that ministry was going to be done on this earth because now the torch of ministry was moving down from Jesus to his disciples and the apostles apostles of the early church, the same power, the same anointing that enabled Jesus to do the work that he did when he ministered here on earth was now going to be working in and through the disciples, the apostles of the, of the early church. And we saw a few weeks ago in Acts chapter 1. Jesus had gathered with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and just before he ascended into heaven, he instructed the disciples not to depart from Jerusalem, but to tarry in the city of Jerusalem, to wait until they would be endued with power from on high. Their instruction was to wait for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. They were going to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. You see, there was an ultimate purpose and desire of God for them to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit because we need to understand the purpose of the Holy Ghost is more than just an emotional experience. The purpose of the Holy Ghost is more than speaking in other tongues. It's more than the shouting. It's more than the dancing. But the ultimate purpose of being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit is so that you and I, the people of God, can be empowered of God himself to tell this world about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, it's now 50 days after the Passover. 120 people gathered together in the upper room waiting for the promise of the Father. And as we look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, there is an important principle that we see taking place in this early church. Verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, here it is, they were all with one accord in one place. One accord in one place in one place. When people are in one accord, that means they are in agreement. They're in complete unity with one another. There is no division in a church where everyone is in one accord. In other words, when a pastor is leading a church and when, when godly men and women pray for wisdom of God as well as advice from godly leaders and a decision is made within a ministry that, that, that needs to take place in a church, this is an example of ministering together in one mind and one accord. But what if, think about this for just a second. What if on the day of Pentecost, someone would have said, well, I don't know why we have to stay up here in this upper room and pray day after day and night after night. We never did it this way before. We've always done it another way. You see, that is an attitude that creates division. It destroys the unity. It creates bitterness. And without spiritual unity, without a church being together in one mind and one accord, the anointing of the Holy Spirit spirit cannot move and operate. See, when you look at the story of the day of Pentecost, 120 people gathered together in this upper room. They were in one mind and one accord because they were in complete unity with each other. Unity about what? They were obeying the command of Jesus Christ to tarry until they were endued with power from on high. And because they submitted to the will of Jesus Christ, their spiritual authority, we see that in the second chapter of the book of Acts, that all 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues 
as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now, because they were filled with the power, because they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they were now enabled to do the work that God had called them to do. And that's why we see in our uh, message last Wednesday night in Acts chapter 3, the apostles had their first demonstration of miracles in the early church. Peter and John were on their way to the temple at three in the afternoon and they met this lame man sitting at the beautiful gate of the temple. And this man was asking for alms and Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says that this man rose up and he went walking and leaping and praising God. And a lot of people that was there in Jerusalem saw this miracle take place. They were eyewitnesses of the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. And they wondered, how is this possible? How can this be that this man who's been lame and he sat there at the gate of the temple for over 40 years, he can now run, he can walk, he can leap. And Peter and John began to preach and they were ministering to the people there in Jerusalem. They told them about the life and the ministry of Jesus and they reminded them of the miracles of God. They reminded the people of Jesus that this was the same one that they had sentenced to be crucified but that God had raised him from the dead and that it was because of the mention of the name of Jesus Christ that this man was now healed. And Peter and John were preaching and this narrative now continues into Acts chapter 4. Let's start there with verse number 1. The Bible says, And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Once again, we see that the apostles are focusing on the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, proclaiming the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was not just an ordinary message of the early church, but th that was the central message. That was their DNA. That was what the early church proclaimed, the subject of the death, burial, and resurrection, also known as the passion of Christ. This was the focal point of every message, of every sermon of every speech that you find written in the book of Acts. And as we see this pattern repeated throughout the book of Acts, this should only serve as an example to teach us how important it is that today we should follow the same apostolic message to preach the never-ending message that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost, and that Jesus Christ is coming again. We must proclaim that he died on the cross, that he lived a sinless life, that he rose from the grave, that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that he is coming back to this earth again. That is the central message of the church. But the priests and the Pharisees, the Sadducees of Jerusalem, they objected to the principle of this doctrine of resurrection itself. Their opposition to the teaching was more than just a, a difference on doctrinal belief. It had something to do with the name of Jesus. Their thoughts were that, you know, if the people are believing and accepting the idea that Jesus, in fact, died on the cross and now that he arose three days later, these people in Jerusalem are going to insist that the Sadducees and the priests and Pharisees were out of the will of God for crucifying God's own son. And for this very reason, verse 3 says, And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. The Sadducees laid hands upon Peter and John, as we see in this text. Now, when you look throughout the Word of God, especially in the days of the early church, it talks about laying hands on individuals. There's several different meanings when we talk about laying hands upon an individual. In some cases, it's talking about a transfer of power. You lay hands upon an individual, it's a transfer transfer of power. In other cases, it means to lay hands upon someone and they 
instantly receive healing or they receive a, a blessing from God. They receive the baptism and the Holy Spirit. But in this case, it's so much different. When the Sadducees laid hands upon Peter and John, it was an aggressive arrest. They were laying hands upon them to take them and hold them captive as a prisoner until the next morning. But regardless of the negative outcome and the negative response from the Jewish leaders, the gospel of Jesus still prevailed in the city of Jerusalem. Verse 4 says, How be it? Let me speak about this for just a second. This means regardless of the response, regardless of the trouble, despite the criticism, how be it? Many of them which heard the word believed and the number of men was about 5,000. I want you to think for just a second. When this lame man in Acts chapter 3, when he immediately received healing, when he immediately had the ability to walk and to run and to jump, this miracle attracted the attention of, of hundreds of people and possibly thousands of people in the Jewish community. And this also gave the opportunity for the apostles to preach the gospel again. And the crowds began to listen. But what we need to understand is it was not the miracle that brought the revival. It's not miracles, signs, and wonders that determines on how great a revival is. We have a lot of churches today and, and in the past that have these revivals and they say come and experience the, the manifestations of the Spirit of God. That is not what draws a revival. The revival is not because of, of an individual being healed. That's not what brought about the repentance there in Jerusalem. But the life-changing faith Faith came not by the miracle, but it came when Peter and John preached the gospel and the people heard the gospel and they accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they accepted the gospel, that is when they repented of their sins and thousands of people came to know Jesus Christ. And despite the persecution, the church continued to grow. You see, sometimes God allows us to go through problems. Sometimes he permits adversity. Sometimes he allows a difficult situation for us to go through so that he can accomplish his perfect will in our life. Pastor, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is this. God did not save us from trouble, but he saved us from sin. I don't know why bad things happen to genuinely good people. All I know is that it does. And life is so daily. It's like an ocean tide. It comes in. Some days we're up. Some days we're down. Some days we don't know where we're at, but all we have to do is just trust in God. So when, when, when the enemy comes in like a flood, we just know that the, the Holy Spirit's going to raise a standard up against it. If God be for us, who can be against us? We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You see, when trouble comes, God's going to see us through. When sadness comes, He's going to give us joy because weeping can only endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When we are afraid, we can understand the word of God says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When we feel weak in our life, we understand that the word of God says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We're going to put on that whole armor of God so that we can stand against the enemy in the darkest days of our life. You see, one of the themes that Luke is constantly talking about throughout the book of Acts is that through every conflict, through every difficult time that the early church faces, the Holy Spirit was sufficient to lead them through and help them to overcome that conflict. You see, this is evident because in verse 4 it says that many of them heard the word and they believed and the number of the men was about 5,000. See, to put this number in perspective, think about this. The entire population of that time in the city of Jerusalem was about 25,000 people. Now, that's a lot of people when you compare the city of Howe. But back then, 25,000 people, that, that was a large city then. The city of Jerusalem now is probably 10 times that size. But the day of Pentecost was a great revival for the church. And after this man in Acts chapter 3 was healed at the beautiful gate of the temple and Peter and John preached, there was more people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost than there was on the day of Pentecost. 
So what that means is over 25% of the city of Jerusalem was, was now saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and was a faithful attender of the church in Jerusalem. That's why the, the, the priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were so worried because the, 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 the number of believers, the number of spirit-filled people in the city of Jerusalem is now starting to overtake the unbelievers. Verse 5 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? When you look at the history of the Jewish law, trials before the Sanhedrin court was to be convened only during the day. And this is why Peter and John was arrested and they were in prison and held overnight. And the Sanhedrin courtroom was a circular room. All of the judges would sit on the outer walls and then the people that was on trial would be placed in the middle. They would be the center of attention. And the question that everyone was asking and the thing that everyone wanted to know was what power what authority were these miracles being accomplished? What name was bringing about these miracles they were seeing when this man was healed at the gate of the temple? You see, in Jewish tradition, a, a person could not teach in his own authority. He had to teach under the name of a, of a well-respected rabbi. And so an example would be uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. As he was baptizing people in the Jordan River, people would question him about his authority to baptize. Even Jesus was questioned about what authority he was ministering by. But Peter answers their question and he begins to preach another message to them. In verse 8, the Bible says, And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is is there salvation in any other? For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. One thing I want us to notice about Peter in this text is that already Peter had been filled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But as time goes by and Peter has been preaching the gospel, he's already uh, been through a lot. He's been ministering to people. He's been uh, dealing with accusations. He's been arrested for preaching preaching the gospel, all of this would make a person physically drained, mentally drained, emotionally drained. And so what happens is Peter needs a refilling. Peter needs a refreshing. He needs a recharging of the power of the Holy Spirit for a moment such as this. And so the concept of a refilling of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is nothing new. In fact, at the end of Acts chapter 4, we see that the believers there in Jerusalem prayed and they were all refilled with the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost soon after he was converted. And then later he experienced a refilling. But in response to the Sanhedrin's question, they asked Peter, what authority did this take place in? And Peter preaches on the identity of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ had given him the authority to do what was being accomplished. He reminds them that Jesus is the one that the Sanhedrin handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. He shares the testimony of the life and the ministry and the crucifixion and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because of his sacrificial death and because of the name of Jesus. That is why this miracle took place. And if the church today, if the churches and the world 
world today could just get a hold of that fact and understand that there, are, there, there is not many ways to salvation. It's only one. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. There is no other way. A priest cannot pray you out of hell. A, a, a rabbi cannot do a, min, a ministry unto you to get you eternal life. It's only by the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John chapter 3 verse 16 through 18, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, it says he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Church, that is the message that we preach. That's the message of the church. It's salvation only in the name of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing that saves the soul from sin. In verse 13 of Acts chapter 4 it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. This is very similar to what we see taking place in our world today. In our public school systems, prayer, and the reading of God's word has technically been banned and we're not able to have group prayer gatherings in, in a lot of our schools not because they do not want religion at school but it's because it has to do with the name of Jesus Christ but yet at the same time we see that principles of Islam can be taught and that being the case I want to remind you that with this being a year of an election you must be careful who you vote for to serve in public office. Now, I am always careful not to voice my own political opinion from the pulpit, but I will address issues concerning what the Bible says and our leaders that serve in our public offices. But when you as an individual vote for a person that endorses abortion, you, in a sense, by voting for them, are supporting abortion, which is murder. When you vote for an individual that endorses the homosexual lifestyle, you, as well, are supporting that particular lifestyle. We have an individual who is not serving in the White House right now, but is clearly stated that if he is elected as President of the United States, that he wants to make sure that there are lessons on the religion of Islam that needs to be taught in our public schools. If you vote for that individual, you support Islam in our public school. So we cannot have prayer let me rephrase that. We cannot have Christian prayers and Bible readings in our school, but yet we can teach the principles of Islam. I remember when I was a student in high school that they did not teach us the Ten Commandments, but yet at the same time in that class of world history, we had a lesson and we had to memorize the pillars of Islam. If, if I'm not mistaken, that's, that's uh, forcing a student to learn a religious principle in a public school. If the, if the Christians cannot do that, then why are the Muslims allowed to do that? Church, we've reversed our values in this nation. 
The world has a hatred toward Christianity. There is a hatred toward the righteousness of God. There is a hatred against anything that is pure and holy. And yet the church, the church, listen to this, the church legally cannot be silenced because we are protected by the Constitution of the United States that says Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. But yet at the same time, the church of Jesus Christ today is silenced by their own choosing. They're silenced because they choose to be silent. Why? Because we're afraid of offending people. What if, what if the same thing that took place in Acts chapter 4 verse 17 happened today? The Jewish leaders, they were not accepting the message that Peter and John preached, which was basically the message of the church. They were preaching the message of the gospel. And so they said the only way to stop them, or so they thought, was to make it illegal for them to preach in the name of Jesus. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Their intention was not just to warn the apostles, but they wanted to intimidate the apostles so that they would no longer preach on the name of Jesus Christ. You see, their primary concern was the content of their teaching. And what's worse today is there is a lot of churches that's being intimidated by current events and they quit preaching the truth of God's word. We're so afraid of offending someone and we spend all of our time trying to figure out how we're going to make the whole church happy and we're trying to figure out how to please everybody. I learned a long time ago it's a whole lot easier just to try to please one individual. If we just please the Lord, we've done all that's required and let God take care of the rest. Just please Jesus and the mission is accomplished. Now I know there's people today that say, well, they've passed a law and we can't do it like we used to do it anymore. And they say, we've got to obey the laws of the land. I know all about obeying the laws of the land. I'm working in the courthouse. I see what's going on in, in government and see what's going on in politics. I understand about obeying the laws of the land. But there comes a time when you have to make a stand for what you know to be right, for what you know to be the truth. How do you think the United States came into existence? People got tired in Europe of the oppression of the laws of the land coming up against the church. And they did something about it. They came to America. When will the church of Jesus Christ today get tired of the oppression of laws that are coming against the church and do something about it and stand up for the truth of God's word anyway and declare to this world that Jesus Christ is still the way, that he is the truth, he is the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. In verse 19, Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. Peter and John are declaring their obligation to publicly share the details of their eyewitness accounts of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And what was taking place was it was an intentional act of disobedience to the law of the land, but at the same time, it was obedience to the word of God. And so here's what happened. They were, they were commanded by the government to no longer teach and preach in the name of Jesus Christ but they did not stop. They kept on preaching. Just because the law said that they can no longer preach in the name of Jesus, Peter and John was not going to back down. But instead, they went to prayer. They called up the prayer chain at First Assembly in, in Jerusalem, if that's what they called it, I don't know. They called the church together, and they began to pray. 
And their prayer meeting was not just an ordinary prayer. This was no, Lord, I'm tired prayer. This was no, woe is me. This was no, I'm all beat up type of prayer. But they went to that prayer meeting in Jerusalem with an intent of seeing an immediate result. And they were not going to give up. They were not going to be denied. And verse 23 says, And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak of thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Notice how their prayer ended. It was prayed in the name of Jesus Christ, that name that has all authority, that name that has all power. This prayer was not prayed by just one single individual. This prayer was not just prayed by the church apostles, but this was a prayer that was prayed together in unity that the church prayed together. They had called a special prayer meeting and they all began to pray in one mind and one accord. The scripture says they prayed in one accord. Here we go again. Something's about to happen. The church was praying together. They were unified together. They were praying in one mind and one accord. Reminds you of what happened on the day of Pentecost. 120 believers of Christ was praying together in one place, in one accord. And the Holy Spirit fell. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. And in that one single day, thousands of people came to know the Lord. And by the end of the day, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And here we are again. The church now has several thousand people and they're coming together for the purpose and that is to pray what were they praying for I believe they were praying for power they were praying for the strongholds of hell to be broken they were praying the word of God and if it would have been me if, if, if we could see what was taking place I believe they would be saying Lord you see the trials you see the testing that we are going through as a church but they're saying God we're going to stand upon your word because your word is a source of truth he said in his word I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it and nobody in this world can stop the church Church. Nobody in this world can destroy the church. Why? Because the world did not build this church. The world did not give this church. And the world cannot destroy the church. Why? Because it's the blood-bought church. It's the blood-bought church. The redeemed of God. The without spot or wrinkle. It's the saints of God. And just like it was on the day of Pentecost, as they began to pray and they began to bombard heaven in one mind and one accord, something miraculous began to take place in that prayer meeting. The Bible says in verse 31 and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own but they had all things common and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them. And bought the prices of the things that were sold. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This was a revival in Jerusalem that was about to spread like wildfire all around this world. 
These people got so full of the Holy Spirit of God that nothing else in this world would matter to them any more than getting the gospel out to the ends of this world as soon as possible. After they prayed, they began to recognize that the possessions they had was nothing of their own, but it was just a blessing from God. They recognized that they could sell these items and they could raise funds for the church and they began to give and the church was going to face obstacles. They knew that. They knew the church was going to have financial need in the future and so they gave in good faith. You see, there wasn't anybody in the days of that early church that claimed anything in the church was theirs, but it all belonged to God. But today in our modern church world, we see so often that it's completely the opposite. Now I understand that people give and people give to support some special project in the church. And I, and I know in every church around that, that we have loved ones and we've had great grandmas and grandpas that have given to, to do a, a particular project in the church. But the problem we see is that in a lot of churches we act like we own it. And we say, well, my great grandpa gave and supported this and this is mine and we can't do anything about it because it's mine. No, sir. No, ma'am. It doesn't work like that. You see, individuals lose the individual ownership when you give it to the Lord. We give it to Him and we are to let God use that gift in the way that He wants it to be used. Everything that we do in the church of Jesus Christ must be done for one purpose and that's to let someone know about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus saves, that Jesus wants to change their life and that their life can be changed forever by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the thing that I want to focus on as we come to a close tonight in this service is the prayer meeting that the early church had at the end of the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. The Bible says that when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. This was not just 120 people now, but this is thousands of people possibly 10 to 15,000 people and they're praying and this prayer meeting was so powerful the Bible says that the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I can only imagine what that prayer meeting would have been like. I remember just a few years ago at, at the church that I was raised at during an altar service on a Sunday night that the, the power of God was moving in such a way that even the musicians and the singers were lost in the spirit. Nobody was singing. Nobody was playing an instrument. And suddenly in that sanctuary, it was just like an ocean tide as waves of the anointing of the Holy Spirit began to sweep across that church sanctuary. And people began to weep across that church auditorium. Some people were shouting. Some would shout glory and they would stomp their feet. Others would shout hallelujah and they would be leaping to their feet and they would be jumping for joy. Some people were kneeling at an altar and as they were crying out to God they, they were just beating upon the altar and they were pleading with God to save their lost loved ones and as God was, was pouring his spirit out upon people and as people were crying out to God and they were worshiping in one mind in one accord it sounded as if an earthquake the sound of a rushing mighty wind sweeping across that sanctuary and I know this is just a Wednesday night Bible study group here at Howe Assembly and I know sometimes we tend to get stuck in a little bit of a tradition but what would happen church if we would just let go of our dignity what would happen if we just let go of our pride and say God it's me it's me standing in the need of prayer I don't care how late it's going to be I don't care what else anyone thinks about me God I've got to have a fresh touch I've got to have the fresh power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life because without God we are absolutely nothing why because he's the source of our strength he's the strength of our life we can stand upon his word. His word is a solid foundation and we can hide that word in our heart that we might not sin against God. I wish somebody would stand to their feet and shout Lord I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your power. I thank you for that anointing. Church if we would just call out to him and say Lord set us on fire again. Fill me once again with that power. Fill us once again with your spirit Lord. Lord from the top of our head to the sole of our feet Lord let us be saturated 
Lord, once again with the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Let us be set free forever in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. He's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the praise. We bless your name. We bless your name forevermore. Hallelujah to your name. We worship you, Jesus, for who you are, the Savior of this world, the creator of this universe. You are worthy, O Lord. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. He is worthy. He is worthy. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, let us never be satisfied. Let us never be complacent. Oh, church, we should never be satisfied with how many we have in the sanctuary. Let's keep working. Let's keep on reaching out. Let's keep knocking doors until this place is filled. Let's keep on working until we feel it again and again and again. There's no limit to what God will do. Let the Let's take off the limit of our life. Let's take off the limit of his anointing and say, God, do what you want to do. Have your way in our life. Have your way in this church. Let this place be shaken by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. If you're here tonight and you're hungry for the power of the Holy Spirit, and you say, Pastor, I'm so hungry. I'm starving to death of the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I want a refilling. I want a refreshing. I want a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want you to come to this front. Come down to this front. We'll pray with you. We'll agree with you with you and let's agree together that God will refill us again with his spirit hallelujah to your name Lord we're hungry for you tonight Jesus we're hungry for you tonight Jesus hallelujah hallelujah is there just one that's hungry is there just one that's hungry oh Lord I'm hungry for you Jesus I'm hungry for you Jesus Lord, fill us full once again of that anointing. Fill us full, Lord, of that Spirit of God. Lord, trans transfer your power, Lord, into our life once again. Oh, Lord, fill us full, Lord, from the top of our head to the sole of our feet, Lord. Let the rushing of a mighty wind, Lord, let every heart and soul be filled, Father, with the power of your Spirit in Jesus' name, Lord. Baptize us fresh and anew with that anointing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah to your name. Let that music of the Holy Spirit begin to fill the sanctuary. Worship Him, church, in spirit and in truth, for He inhabits habits the praises of his people hallelujah to your name hallelujah to your name oh we thank you Jesus we thank you Jesus we thank you Lord oh Lord set us on fire once again Lord, you are preparing this church today for such a time as this, Lord, that lives would be changed, that people would be set free forever by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Not by might, nor by power, but by your Spirit. Oh, Lord, draw us nearer to you, Jesus. Let us never be the same again, Lord. So hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name. Lord, we pray the strongholds would be broken, God. That addictions would be broken, Lord. That the bound would be set free, Father. That the convicting power of your Spirit, Lord, would reach across this community and around this region, Lord, through our internet service, God. That people around this world will come to know you and their life would be changed in the name of Jesus. Lord, let that fire begin to burn in our heart. Let that fire begin to burn in this church. Let that fire begin to burn in our lives in Jesus name hallelujah to your name thank you for watching today if we have reached you we would like to hear from you you can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God P.O. Box 97 Howe, Oklahoma 74940 we invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God Sunday morning Sunday school at 930 Morning worship at 1040, 
Sunday evenings at 6 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.